morning.
Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for all your love, your blessings. We thank you for this family. God, uh, as we uh, listen with the lesson today, pray for your spirit just to uh, um, soften our hearts, open our ears and our eyes, God, that we may see and understand uh, your wisdom and not ours. God, I pray for those who are listening on the live stream, Father, that you just uh, you help them also, Father, wherever they're at in their lives. God, I just pray that your word just move powerfully in their lives, in our lives. Thank you so much for all that you do. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, South Bay family. It's good to see you guys. Thanks. Um, so, I am grateful to uh, be together and to have another week of our first steps training. Um, I am sad because my wife will not be joining me this morning. My better half, I know. Sorry, you just got me this morning. Um, but I'm grateful I have the Holy Spirit. Um, but my wife is at home with our kids. Carrie has a, uh, she's had a pretty awful cough the last couple nights. So I actually slept in Carrie's bed last night. And Carrie slept with Catherine <laughs> to monitor her. So I was sleeping with Carrie's princess blanket and everything with the boys. Um, but we're going we're gonna to dive right into our study this week, which is sin. Yeah, there's crickets. <laughs> That's what I figured. So we'll get into this. Um, let's pray first, though, because it seems like uh, Satan has been throwing some wrenches into the mix this morning. Um, in lots of different, uh, in lots of different lives, uh, we've we've heard different things going on this morning that sad, frustrating. Uh, so let's just pray. Uh, God, we thank you for this time together. God, thank you for your Holy Spirit, and God, the way that you lead us and guide us, and the the circumstances that we face in this life, uh, they don't have to crush us. They don't have to. Uh, make us stumble and fall. God, uh, they won't if we turn to you and if we follow your lead. Uh, so God, everything that's going on this morning, I pray that there would be peace in our hearts, that our eyes would be fixed on you. God, for the, those who are sick, including my daughter, that you would bring healing. Uh, for uh, those who um, are, have gone through surgeries uh, like David Blanco, God, that you would bring healing there as well and uh, just tremendous recovery, and uh, God, that, uh, that we would just trust in you, in the good times and the sad times of life, um, that we would walk more and more closely with you. Uh, please lead us in your word, God, these are not my words, these are your words, and I pray that your words would convict us this morning, and, uh, just, uh, and just uh, that our ears would be wide open to where you're calling us in life. Pray these things in your son's name, amen. Okay, so with these studies, I just want to give a few ground rules or uh, just tips as we have done each week. Um, with these studies, many of you know this, but it's just a helpful reminder. When you're studying with someone, it's, it's important to have multiple people with you. Um, one, because we need each other and we need is all kinds of relationships for this person to be doing well spiritually and to have a sustainable faith, we need encouragement uh, and challenging and sharpening from all different areas and, and different um, people. And it's also helpful because one person can be leading the study while another one is the scribe and writing down notes. So then you can hand those notes to the person and they can take them home and, and, uh, and go through them and study through them on their own. I still have some of the notes from my Bible studies when I was 14 years old. 
And, and, and it's cool because the, the scriptures are the same. The images we use are the same, but it's, it's Jamie Facino's handwriting. My discipler in, in middle school and high school. And it's just cool to think about Jamie Facino writing these things down in his little tidbits. Um, so uh, handwritten notes, handing those off, it's special. Um, and with... Uh, with this study in particular, but with all of them, there's, there's going to be some, some pictures you draw. And it's going to be important to draw those out and to know those, rather than looking at a booklet and like, here, look at this. Uh, this is what we're talking about, light and darkness. Write them out, draw them. So have a notebook on hand and uh, someone as a scribe. And it's also important that the person who... Uh, hopefully this person becomes a disciple, the person who will be in a discipling relationship with them, that they're in the studies with them. That they know where this person has come from, what their struggles are, and then, and then that person would carry on past baptism and continue to disciple them and be in there with them. Um, and again, in all of this, we are not, uh, we're not trying to just transfer information, but we're trying to move the heart in all of this. Um, and, and with studying for disciples, studying the Bible, you know, Steve sent out an email this week, and we've been talking about solidifying, um, solidifying, unifying, and multiplying, and studying the Bible with someone is one of the best ways that we can accomplish all three of those things. Solidify our own convictions. Solidify, uh, solidify why we chose to follow Christ in the first place. And it unifies us. When I study the Bible with someone, you know, let's say Simon and I are studying the Bible with someone, man, Simon and I are unified. We are, we're being trained together as we are teaching the scriptures to this person, and, and we're also multiplying in the meantime, right? So studying the Bible is one of the best ways to accomplish all three of those things. So sin, it's important with this study that you express, over-communicate that there will be confidentiality in this study. That what you share with me and what I share with you, we expect that it doesn't go outside of this group. Um, and it's important for you to model vulnerability. If you model kind of a shallow vulnerability, that is probably what you're going to get from, from the person you're studying with. But if you dig down deep, they, st they might not... They might not uh, Model your depth, but it will likely help them to go deeper. Amen. And then let the word convict. Um, something that I'll touch, touch on, that sometimes, uh, sometimes a passage doesn't, you're like, wait a second, I expected more out of that. I have felt this, like, I feel like I need to force this. Like, I don't think you heard the scripture right. Because your body language is cool, calm, and collected. But don't force it. Especially in this first scripture we're going to read. Let the word convict. The word is our judge. Uh, we don't need to judge. We present the scripture and we help guide them to it. Um, and then with this study, if, if a person walks away just totally cool, like, this is great, I loved it. If, if there doesn't seem to be heart movement in the sin study, or at least conviction... Um, then you may have missed something or they may be protecting themselves. And, and so you might need to uh, dig a little deeper or, um, or spend some time in prayer um, or just have some more discovery. But this, this study, it should, it should strike a little bit of fear and discomfort or a lot of fear and discomfort. And that's a good thing because... Uh, fear of God is what? The beginning of wisdom and knowledge. So that's a good thing. Um, so the objective of this study is to define sin and to identify it and its consequences. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's turn over there. 1 Peter chapter 2. And you know what? I was totally going to bring a whiteboard to draw these out for you, but in the uh, mix of the morning, I forgot the whiteboard. So, 
I'm glad I put them on the screen. <laughs> but that's something that you would be drawing. First Peter. Thank you. Okay, verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness into His wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So with this, we, have, we obviously have a differentiation that is being made. Light and darkness. And so you ask the person, what are some, what are some characteristics of those who are in the darkness? And they can go through this scripture and it might take them a little while to pinpoint um, not a people. That the people in the darkness haven't received mercy. You can, you can add to it that they are lost. You just... You sh- probably just did discipleship, if you're following the, the order of the studies. So you can talk about how um, in the darkness, it's um, those who are not Christians, those who are not disciples, right? Because we made that, that distinction. But really, it's the same, Christian and disciple. So this, this is the people who are not in the darkness, and then those who are in the light. What does the scripture say about those who are in the light? Well, pretty easy after you figure out one side. Not a people, they are the people of God. Haven't received mercy, those in the light have received mercy. Saved and forgiven. Christians, disciples are in the light. And then you say every person is is in one or the other. There's no gray area. There's no limbo. So upon reading this scripture, where would you say you are? And let there be a pause. Let there be silence. Because people wrestle with this. I mean, think about when you studied, when you read this for the first time, when you were in a Bible study and you had to, you had to figure out, wait, where am I? The light or the dark? That's some wrestling. Let them wrestle. And they might say, you know, someone might say, oh, I'm absolutely in the darkness, no doubt about it. Um, you know, ask, ask my husband or wife. Um, and, okay, great, they have some self-awareness. Someone might say, I'm, I, I think I'm in the light. Uh, maybe I'm closer to the line, but I think I'm in the light. Or I'm kind of on the verge, I'm in that gray area. Like I'm coming out of the darkness, but the light, like the light is kind of shining on me. I've heard all these answers. So then you can ask them, okay, so, so what makes you say that you're in the gray area? Or what makes you say that you're at, like I'm in the light? And some of the things that I've heard, well, I, I go to church. I, I'm not as bad as this person. I haven't murdered anyone, yep. Um, so then they're comparing themselves to other people. And so then, so then if they're dead set on where they landed, like I'm in the gray area or I'm in the light, don't, don't force it. No, you're in the darkness. <laughs> like, um, I'll even ask, like, okay, so I, I asked someone this the other day, is that your final answer? <laughs> like, are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, awesome. Let's, let's move on. Let's move on to the next scripture. Because, again, we are not the judge. And the following scriptures, man, they're going to go deeper and deeper and convict more and more. So let the word of God do its work. And then if they're still in that place, then you can help them out at the end. Um, Or you can, again, have some more discovery. Because at the end of the day, we're just trying to figure out where someone's at. We're not saying, like, prove to me. We're trying to figure out where they're at in their relationship with God. Um, and, and again, consider, consider some of these studies when you studied the, for the first time. 
and, and what helped you. Uh, just, just as reference, John chapter 12, verse 48. There is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. That very word which I spoke will condemn him on the last day. Keep that in mind. You're bringing people to the word of God. Yes. Don't force it. Um, let the word judge and convict. Isaiah 59. So again, you're drawing this out, darkness and light. And so this is on the note that they will take home with them. Isaiah chapter 59. Okay, verse 1. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, amen, nor his ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Whew! That is powerful and it's scary. So according to this verse, what separates you know, we just talked about light and darkness. What separates God who is in the light from man or someone in the darkness? Sin. Your sin and your iniquities. For all intents and purposes, let's just say sin and iniquities are the same thing here. There are some differentiations that can be made, but that's for, uh, that's for deeper study. <laughs> but your sins and your iniquities separate you from God. So then you draw this picture. You're like, man, don't put you, because, you know, we're still, <laughs> we're, we're still getting them there. Um, unless they say, I'm totally in the darkness. Okay, if you admit you're in the darkness, then this is, this is what it looks like. Man is in the darkness. There is a wall. There's no, like, skylight in that area, so you get a little bit, like, there's a wall that is separating man from God. And that wall is sin. And in our relationship with God, what is it that happens along the way that takes that wall away? Repentance, Jesus. So you ask them, like, how do we get rid of this wall? How do we come into a relationship with God rather than being separated from Him? Let them wrestle with that. Ultimately, you come to God's forgiveness. Something that I ask at this point or ask them to consider, is consider any relationship. Consider whoever they are. You know, you can tailor it to who you're talking to. Let's say it's, it's a married man. Say, in your relationship with your wife, if you have said something that has hurt your wife, and there has been a divide, a wall between you and her, there's tension, what can you do to take that wall down, that wall of division? Well, you know, I can apologize, I can, try to, I can try to make up for it, I can get her flowers. And, okay, well, those are all good things, but that's not going to take the wall away unless she forgives you. That's when the wall comes down. And you, man, maybe there's, maybe there's more built up stuff, so she's not ready to forgive you yet. And you're doing all these good things, but those good things aren't good enough to break the wall down. It's her forgiveness. And the same goes with God. God's forgiveness and only his forgiveness destroy the wall that separates us. But then you come to, in that relationship to the embrace, the humble embrace of one another. That God, God has forgiven, but are we surrendered to embracing that forgiveness? Um, so, the sin, the wall, the separating barrier, it comes down to God's forgiveness and us surrendering to that forgiveness and embracing God. Romans chapter 3. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. I mean, you guys can all agree, right? <laughs> I, I strictly went by age on this one. I just figured. <laughs> I 
<laughs> I think Steve would admit. Okay, Romans chapter 3. You, you know where this is going. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by, uh, by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because in His forbearance He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Okay, so according to this, who has sinned? Everyone. Everyone has sinned. And what did we already find out about sin? What does sin do? It separates us from God. Everyone has sinned. So I want you to consider, I'm going to draw a little, a little image, a little bar graph, and I want you to consider who is further away from God. And so you, you draw this, and you, know, you can put whoever you want. Make it fun. Hopefully, hopefully you can produce some laughter. You can put yourself as the one who has the most sin. Um, but in this case, I have the least amount of sin. And then, and then it's Brian, and then it's, and then it's Steve. <laughs> um, so, so I have, let's just say I've sinned the least because I'm the youngest. Right, right? That's, I mean, that's the logic behind all of this. <laughs> And then Brian has sinned, he's kind of in the middle. Uh, he's a little bit older. And then Steve has sinned the most because he's the oldest of the three. So who is further from God? It's got to be Steve. It's got to be Steve. We're all equal. Because we all have sinned and we all have fallen short of the glory of God. And if we are all in the darkness in that sin, it doesn't matter where you're at in the darkness, you're in darkness. And you are separated from God, and each one of us needs to be in the light with God. We're not comparing our sin to one another. We desperately need to be with God. So all are lost because all have sinned. <clears throat> So draw this out in your notebook, make it fun, but again, this study should be convicting Amen. them. Something that, uh, something that you can again reiterate here is that, that nothing we do, no effort we make can get us right with God. That it, it doesn't matter if I've sinned less, it doesn't make me any closer to God or any more in the light. We need God's forgiveness. We need his grace. And so uh, a good moral life does not save you. You cannot earn salvation by your good deeds. Again, we are saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. So that's what this scripture then goes on to say, that we are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And that word freely, that is God. That is his decision to forgive us because he loves us. And we're going to see that word come up again in this study, that it's not something you earn. It is something that is freely given. Another thing to touch on in this, with this verse, did I turn it off? Fidel, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, defining sin. Sin in the Greek is harmatia, and it's to miss the mark. You think about archery or a dartboard. You're aiming for that bullseye, and if you miss, you miss. And so what is our aim? If we're, if we're trying to uh, if, we're have, if we have a relationship with God or we're trying to get right with God, what is our aim? Our mark is Jesus. We're aiming to be like Jesus. And if we miss the mark, then we have to refocus on the mark, Jesus. Um, so 
then we'll, then we'll go into some sin lists. So these are all things, these sins that we're about to go through, these are all th- ways that we miss the mark. These are all ways that we fall short in following Christ, which inevitably puts us in the darkness. So we're not going to go through each of these sin lists. I know, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you guys are bummed. But Galatians chapter 5, these are all examples of sin. And we're actually going to print out, um, some of you may have the bookmarks of the definitions of all these sins from years ago. We're going to reprint those out and, and pass them out. Because you've got to be prepared when you enter this study with someone, because they're going to ask, what is that sin? I've never heard of that. Or what's the difference between these? And you've got to be prepared. Not be a deer in the headlights. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't know what that sin is. Um, 2 Timothy 3 is, uh, that's a great one. It talks about being a lover of self, which ultimately is, is at the root of these sins. Loving ourself, our eyes focused on ourself rather than on God. And then James chapter 4, verse 17, the sins of omission. Knowing the good we ought to do, but not doing it. So f- have an example for yourself of the good you know you ought to do that you don't do. Because this, is, this can be a confusing one, the sins of omission. Um, so an example that was shared with me the other day was like, I know I should let that person in or people in in front of me when I'm driving, but I don't want to. <laughs> and when I choose not to, because I'm like, no, like, I, I was here first. That's, that's something good you can do that you're not doing. And so there's a lot of that. Once you drill down into those things, you're like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. I'm sinning all the time. Those sins of omission, omission are all over the place. So have some examples on hand, the sins of omission. And then something else that's... Um, that, th- this is something that, um, that I've learned from Catherine that she likes to do is to differentiate the sinful nature uh, compared to individual acts of sin. Because... In those individual acts of sin, there is a sinful nature at the root. So getting down to that sinful nature, like, okay, what's the, what's the natural sin that is coming out in this way? Um, so differentiating that. Something that I have realized more and more and more is when I'm confessing sin, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about, for instance, this week I talked about uh, I talked about laziness with a couple of the teen guys. And I talked about how, you know, I, I set my alarm for this time, and then I woke up an hour later. I snoozed, and I didn't even realize it, because I just kept the phone in bed with me. I kept snoozing. <laughs> and it, it is kind of funny. And, it, okay, yeah, I was just lazy. But then you drill down, and you're like, it was, it was because I valued time in bed rather than valuing time with God, because that's what I was going to spend that time doing. And then you drill down further, and you're like, okay, so that's selfishness, because I was selfish. Instead of giving my time to God, I took it for myself. And then you drill down further, that's idolatry. I was idolizing myself and my, and my sleep more than giving God, the God, the King, honor. And that's more convicting than just saying, like, oh, I, I was lazy this week. I should have, I hit my, I hit snooze. I was idolatrous this week. I idolized myself. I was king. That's convicting. So making that differentiation, just asking some discovery questions, like, okay, what's, you know, what was behind that? What, what made you do that? Um, and again, in all of this, setting the example in your vulnerability. Like, it's not comfortable to share that, what I just shared with you. But I'm glad you know now, because you can help me. And it also humbles me before God, like, dang, I, I need God. I need God as much today as I did when I entered the waters of baptism. Um, so go through these sin lists and, and be ready to talk through the different sins. 
And, you know, something that, something that we can sometimes hone in on is like, uh, okay, let's just, let's just talk about a couple of your major sins. Let them talk. If, don't narrow it down to like, let's just talk about a couple. But really share vulnerable, vulnerably. And it's, it's good to share uh, maybe a, a sin from your past that just was a sinful nature of yours for a while, but also sin that you're dealing with right now. Because we could talk about our past all we want, and it, it, it's really of not much consequence. Maybe, maybe some more than others, but it's like, oh yeah, that happened 10 years ago. It's easier to share. But then you share like, you know what, but this morning, before I came to this study, I was angry, I was fr- like I, had, I yelled at someone on the road, I had impure thoughts, like, man, those are some, whew, those are a little bit harder to share. So model that vulnerability, past and present sin. Okay, Romans chapter 6, last one here. So we're talking about the consequences of sin. So all of these sins, they separate us from God. We fall short of God's glory because of these. We are in the darkness. And it's not just like, okay, we're separated, but there is consequence to these actions. It says in verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you can, you can go through a wage. Like what's a wage? Something you earn. When you go to work, you earn a wage. Maybe it's in the form of a salary. Maybe it's in the form of an hourly wage. But you earn a wage. For the effort you put forth, you get something back. So for the effort you put forth in sinning, what do you earn? You earn death. Death. So as we are sinning, as we are, even if we're trying to live a good life and trying to be holy and we go to church and we read our Bible, if we're just trying on our own efforts outside of a relationship with God, we are just earning death. But again, we see something that God gives us. Not something we earn, so you have this comparison, something you earn and a gift. So what is the gift? What is the gift from God? Eternal life. life. So how do we earn it? We We don't earn it. It's a gift. So what do we do with a gift? How do we get a gift? We, We take it. We accept it. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about in, in future studies what that looks like. How do we receive this gift? How do we accept it and what do we do with it? Because we don't just receive it and put it on a shelf and go back to our old life. It requires something of us. It will change us. But it, it does take us having the humility and the surrender to receive it. So we earn death, but God gives us life in Christ. So as you send them away, you know, this is a a heavy study. It can be. Um, And so you send them away. You know, we've talked about sin today. We've talked about a lot of kind of deeper things. But the hope in all of this, the joy in all of this, is that Christ died on the cross. And because of his decision to give up his life and raise from the dead, we have a chance that this isn't what we're defined by, but that we can have a resurrected life in Christ as well. So even though we've talked about some heavy stuff and some dark stuff, there is hope. And we're going to look at uh, Jesus and we're going to look at the cross next time. But in the meantime... Here are some scriptures that you can send them home with. Mark chapter 7, verse 20, Colossians 3, 2 Timothy 3, Revelation 21, 8, and 1 Corinthians 6. And then, in, uh, and then give them the, the homework, the challenge to write a letter 
to God addressing your own specific personal sins. And you can model it for them. Again, you can share from your own life. You can share from when you wrote a letter to God. Some of the things that, that maybe you, uh, that you wrote in that letter. Maybe some of the things that, that caused you to kind of stumble in that letter. Or you're like, I don't know if I should share this. I don't know how specific I should get. Share those things because you've been through this. Um, and, and just tell them, reiterate, like, hey, if, if you hit any, any bumps along the way or if you're confused, or what, just call me. We can get together. We can pray. Um, and, then, and then you'll come back together uh, next time to talk through that, talk through those scriptures and talk through that letter. You know, when I, when I wrote that letter, I tried to include every possible sin I could ever think of. I was 14 years old, so I've sinned a lot more since then. But I, I've gone back and read that, and some of those, I'm like, I don't think I would have included that now. But I was just like, man, I want to get it all out there. Encourage them to just get it all out, out there on the table. And, um, yeah, and then again, uh, share, share in that vulnerability. I want, as, as we break into discussion groups, I want you to consider how have you missed the mark. This is going to be an opportunity to, to confess with one another. Because we need, we need ample opportunity to get stuff off our chests. If you don't feel comfortable uh, doing that right now, then maybe you can pray with that person and spend some time praying with the things that, that make us stumble. Um, some of you are visiting us for the first time, so maybe you're like, I don't know this person, I don't want to share with them. Um, but I, I, challenge, I challenge you guys, if you have something, which you, you should, especially given the sins of omission, <laughs> um, to spend some time confessing. Have you missed the mark? Spend some time confessing to God as well in prayer. And then we'll, we'll pull back together and, um, and uh, sing some songs and get into the Word again. Um, so how much time do we have? Okay, 15 minutes. So break into your uh, mission points, um, and then maybe you can break down even if your mission point is big. Guys and girls, split in your mission points. Father, uh, we're so comforted knowing that we have a relationship with you, uh, and even with that, though, there can be times of tragedy. Uh, I do want to pray in a special way for the Snyder family and uh, the Ailey family and the loss, the tragic loss that took place this weekend. Uh, be with everyone involved. Help them during this time. Uh, as a fellowship, help us to be there as an encouragement, uh, but more than anything, uh, Father, we pray that you can use this time to help people see how significant it is to have a relationship with you, the power and the peace that can come with that. I do want to offer up a special prayer again for David Blanco and his recovery coming off of his surgery. Uh, please, please be with uh, David and Kathleen. Just, uh, again, help them through this time as well. I know they've been very encouraged by the love and the outreach that they've been on the receiving end of. Enable us to just remember them, keep us in our minds, on our heart, and our prayer uh, as he moves forward in this next chapter in his life. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this time. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If I could just state it briefly, too. I know with, with some of you, uh, in light of the Snyders, this may bring to mind questions and what it is that's going on. Uh, I do want to encourage you at this point uh, to refrain from calling them unless you're in the immediate uh, know of what it is that's taking place. As soon as we have more information and the families feel good about that information coming forward, we will do just that. I know a number of you are going to be participating in meals. We'll have additional announcements as we move forward, but I, I do want to ask you to refrain uh, from contacting Amy at this point. She has the necessary support, support she needs and really doesn't need, I know it's in love, but doesn't need a lot of other inquiries at this time. Thank you. Good morning, church. Welcome to South Bay. We are so glad to have you here today. Um, happy February. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so February is Black History Month, and to commemorate this period, uh, we will be highlighting some important figures that have helped to shape our history and significantly impacted our society as a whole, not just within the African American community. Uh, so we will be presenting a series of profiles uh, written in the first person, and I'll be presenting the first one. Lonnie Johnson. I was born on October 6, 1949 in Mobile, Alabama. At, the, at an early age, I would watch my father, who was a handyman, fix things, and I was always curious about how things worked and how he would fix them to make them work. I hold a bachelor's degree in engineering and a master's in nuclear engineering from Tuskegee University. After college, I joined the United States Air Force and later worked for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratories, JPL. After leaving the Air Force, I started my own company and still run it today. While I have over 133 patents, I am known mostly for being the inventor of one of the best-selling toys of all time, the Super Soaker. <laughs> my name is Lonnie Johnson. <laughs> I was born in 1971. In 1991, I earned my degree in computer science and machine learning from Brown University. From 1995 to 2000, I helped birth Shockwave, a tech platform used for building interactive multimedia applications, web animation, and video games. Without Shockwave, there would be no streaming. I have changed the way we view and share GIFs, video, and basically how we live our lives online. In 2007, I joined Hulu to help launch the streaming service as a member of the senior management team. I then went on to run BET Digital until eventually becoming the chief digital officer in the Obama administration's Department of Education in 2015. In 2016, I co-founded T-Equitable, an independent confidential platform to address issues of bias, discrimination, and harassment in the workplace to help companies be more inclusive. It allows employees to, to confidenti confidentially discuss workplace complaints and receive assistance on how to address these issues. I'm committed to using technology as a means to help and improve and heal the world. My name is Lisa Gilopter. I was born June 3rd, 1904 in Washington, D.C. I was an American physician, surgeon, and medical researcher. I developed large scale of blood bank systems in early World War II. I allowed the, it allowed the medics to save thousands of lives in Allied forces during the war. I protested against the practice of racial segregation and the donation of blood, as it lacked scientific foundation. I resigned my position with the American Red Cross which maintained the policy until 1950. I was the most prominent African American in the field at the time. I died in 1950 at age 45 in Burlington, North Carolina. My name is Charles Richard Drew, MD. I was born December 31st, 1995. I am an American gymnast. At the age of 17, I was the first person of African descent of any nationality in Olympic history to become the individual all-around champion and the first U.S. gymnast to win gold in both the individual and all-around and team competition at the same Olympics. There was a movie made about me in 2014. I had my own reality TV show. I also wrote a book about what it takes to be an Olympic gold medalist by determination and perseverance. My name is Gabby Douglas. Uh, thank you, volunteers, for uh, letting us know more about uh, African Americans of history. Let's uh, all stand, and we're going to sing Canaan's Land.
to Canaan's land.
stood before my failure carried the cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my flow now to stand what can I say
Well, good morning again. You got me again. Um, I got my double monitors up here, so I have enough room for everything. That was incredible. I didn't know Ben could sing. Woo! Yeah, and if this is your first time with us, um, I literally, that's the first time I've seen Ben sing. So you got to see something for the first time that I got to see for the first time. Um, that was great. I started, to do, um, I started to get teary-eyed over there. I had to hold it back because I knew I was coming up here. But I started to get emotional just seeing people stepping up. Not that they haven't done so already, but finding out things that we are able to do because God has given us the strength to do them and doing it all to build up the church. That's incredible. And so I can't wait to see more and more what God has put in each of you and over the years, how, how it will be used to build up the church. Yes. It's exciting to think about. Yep, yep. Yep. Okay, so it is good to be together. Um, if you came in after uh, around 11, the, this morning we, we, we did a Bible study on sin. And one of the scriptures that, um, that we didn't cover, but that is a great scripture is what we're going to look at right now in Colossians. And the sermon is titled, From Death to Life. And we talked about how sin separates us from God. And sin is what puts us in darkness. If God is in the light and sin separates us from God, then at some point we are in the darkness. And, and in Romans 6, we read that, that the wages of sin... When we sin, we are earning death. So how do we get out of this grim existence in death into life? So we'll look at Colossians chapter 3. So if you will, turn over or, or uh, scroll over there. If you need help, go eat popcorn. <laughs> and that still goes through my mind every time I'm turning to one of those. Okay, so we're going to read Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 17. That picture is right below our mailboxes at our apartment complex. And I was walking in from parking on the street. I was walking past the mailboxes, and it, I almost did like a double take. Like, there's a plant growing out of this little patch of dirt that I have never noticed before because nothing ever grows there. But with all the rain, it has nourished something that was in there and has produced life in the most unlikely of places. And I, that, that is an image of what God does in us and what, what God gives us through Christ. Life in sometimes the most unlikely of lives. Considering our past, considering the things we've done, the things we've said, the things we are not, uh, we're not proud of, and that God can produce life in that death, in, that, in, that, uh, in, that, in those circumstances. So that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. This is Paul writing here. He says, since then you have been raised with Christ. And I'll, I'll just give you a little preface. This chapter, he is reminding these disciples about the old life compared to the new life they have in Christ. It's a reminder and an encouragement. So I hope it's the same for you right now. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, 
rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self and, and with its practices and put on a new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God to the Father through him. It's a powerful passage of scripture that Paul wrote to this church. I hope it encouraged you. I hope that it challenged you. I hope that it reminded you of where you have come from or maybe where you currently are and where you want to be and what God's plan is for you to have a new life. I want to hone in on a few things here, though. So in this, uh, in this Paul, he lays out kind of like what we looked at um, an hour ago, darkness and light. He keeps referring to death and life, death and life. And so there's this picture of what death in the old self looked like and what it produced and what life in Christ looks like and what it produces, some of the fruit that we should see in our life in Christ. I want to start out in verse 5. Look back at verse, at, at verse 5. Paul says, Put to death these things, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. Put to death your sinful nature, your earthly nature. Now, that is not, that's not encouraging language. That's not light language. Like, ah, try harder. <laughs> Paul is saying, kill it. Whatever evil, whatever sinful nature, kill it. Don't take it lightly. Don't think that it's just going to, it's just going to, you're going to somehow avoid it. Kill it. Put it to death. So think about maybe some of these things in this list were like, oh, that's me. Maybe it triggered some things in you, reminded you. Or maybe you just think about other ways that you know, like, man, I, I have fallen short. I have sinned. How, what does it look like to put that to death? Not to try harder, but what does it look like for you to put that sin to death? How radical will you need to be to kill it? And what language are we using when we're talking about it? I want you to consider it because it's serious. Christ didn't die so that we could try harder. He died and raised so that we would follow him and imitate him. So consider putting to death. What does that look like? And then, and then in verse 8, he says, But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. What does that look like, ridding yourself of something? Something happened yesterday where a bee, we were at Clay and Yana Kenworthy's uh, baby shower, and a bee uh, came onto Carrie's shirt, my daughter, came onto her shirt, and at first she, she was just kind of swiping it away, but then it landed on her shirt, and it was just hanging out there. And I didn't know it, but she starts panicking and screaming, and I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened? I thought a bee, I thought it had flown up under and, like, and, uh, and stung her, but it was just hanging out there. And, but she was like, ah! 
And I just thought about that, like, you know, if you're afraid of spiders or if you're afraid of bees and you see someone trying to rid themselves of these creatures, it's no light matter. They want to get as far away from it as possible. That's how we need to approach sin in our life. To get as far away from it. And not just to get away from it, but to turn to God. So what does it look like for you to rid yourself of these things? I remember at one point, I, I don't have this in my notes, but at one point I was, I was giving in to impurity over and over and over. And I, and I wanted to say, you know what, I'll, I'll try harder. I, you know, it's, it, this is, the, this is the, the trick. But then, but I kept giving into it. And so I, you guys, many of you know Jason Rain in Long Beach. He's a brother in our Long Beach church. I, I texted him. I was like, hey, on Sunday morning, I am giving you my laptop. And I will figure out what I'm going to do <laughs> without a laptop. But you can keep it as long as I tell you to keep it. And if I ask for it back, then you better question me and you better make sure that I have the right measures in place that it's not going to be an issue. But I, I just gave him a backpack with my laptop in it. I needed to rid myself because all of my efforts were, were falling short. So what does it look like to rid yourself of the sin, of the earthly nature? Verse 6. Paul says, because of these things, because of this sin, this earthly nature, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is coming. Now, God doesn't want us to live in a state of fear of him. It says in Hebrews, to approach him with confidence. His throne of grace. He's a gracious God. But there is wrath. There is something that, that in us that we need to be reverent and fearful of God. And not that it should, like, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with him, but I want to be close to him. I want to know him. I want to be on his side. And, and when I was studying the Bible, I mentioned this earlier, when I was studying the Bible as a 14-year-old, I was, I was going through the studies, I was going through the motions, you know, my, the guys who were studying the Bible with me, they'd give me something to do, like, hey, talk to your parents about this, or go read this, or here's some homework for you, and I'd come back, and they're like, so how'd it go? I'm like, oh, I didn't do it. Okay, why didn't you do it? Uh, yeah, I just got caught up in school and soccer, and I'd have all these excuses. I didn't fear God. This wasn't, this wasn't important. I didn't see the significance in what I was doing until... I read some of these scriptures about the wrath of God. And I was, I was getting on an airplane to go to North Carolina to visit some family, and it hit me. I am separated from God. I'm in the darkness. If I go down on this plane, if something happens to me, I am not in a right relationship with the Lord. And it scared the tar out of me. And I was praying more than I've ever prayed. prayed on that plane while I was in North Carolina on the way back. I'm like, Lord, please don't let anything happen to me. And so that fear was the beginning of knowledge, understanding who God is. And then that fear turned into reverence and it turned into love for God and appreciation for his faithfulness to me. What Christ did on the cross that I could have a res I mean, that fear was the beginning of appreciating God and, and, and figuring out what it meant to have a right relationship with Him. The wrath of God is coming. And I want to look at verse 9 and 11. You know, we've looked at some of the, some of the dark and death of this passage, but I want to look at the life that Paul talks about. Verse 9 through 11, Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. 
Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What Christ did on the cross and in his resurrection, there is a new humanity that has formed around Christ. Where there aren't dividing walls, there aren't barriers, there aren't groups of people. Oh, you're in that group, you're in that group. We are all one in Christ. And so this sinful nature, the things that we need to rid ourselves of and put to death, those are the things that divide us from each other and those are the things that divide us from God. And Paul says, get rid of those things so that there aren't any dividing walls in your relationship with God or in your relationships with each other. But instead, he says, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. In this new humanity that is formed around Christ with our eyes fixed on Christ, there are no dividing walls. We rid ourselves of the old life and we put on a new life. And that new life should look something like compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. In that new life in Christ, there is forgiveness for one another as God forgave us. This is the life that is attractive. This is the life that draws people into it and into Christ. This is the good news of Christ. It's not that he died, but it's that he raised from the dead and has created something new for us. The way that we were doing things as as human beings kept failing and kept going down the wrong path and kept being unfaithful to God, and Jesus set a new example that we would follow. And a couple times in here, Paul talks about gratitude and thankfulness. Gratitude and thankfulness. And in gratitude and thankfulness, these these things that we're supposed to clothe ourselves, they just naturally come. If we're thanking God for each other, we're going to be compassionate with each other, for each other. If we're thanking God for one another and for our relationship with God, there will, hum- there will be humility. If you're frustrated with someone and you start thanking God for that person, the things you love about them, man, forgiveness is already taking place in your heart. Let us put on this clothing of Christ. I think about, I was thinking about back when I was in Boy Scouts. We would go away for a weekend or a week. And some of these places we went didn't have showers. And so, and you know, especially in the summer in Colorado, in the mountains, start to get a little funky or a lot funky. And so we would, I would come back from a weekend or a week away if they didn't have showers and my clothes stink, I stink. My mom's like, you're not doing anything until you get in the shower, put on some new clothes. But I remember... Like, even as a boy, even as a teenager, I'm like, this is kind of gross. Like, I need, to, I need to get clean. And so I remember, like, taking off the dirty clothes, like, ridding myself of, of the filth, and then getting in a shower and cleaning myself, and then stepping out into new, fresh clothing. It was, like, refreshed, like, anew. Like, oh, this is awesome. It's like a new existence. Think about that in your relationship with God. That's what is happening. You're not cleaning yourself, but God has cleansed you. You're not not trying to like be clean in these funky old clothes. God is giving you clothes to put on. To imitate Christ, put on these things. I need some water real quick. Okay, so we're going 
We're going to take communion in just a second. And I want you to consider that um, sometimes, sometimes as I have, when I've taken communion before, I have thanked God for what He's done for me. I have considered maybe the things that I did that week that, you know, things, ways that I missed the mark. And then I walk away from communion and I do the same exact thing. Even though I appreciated God and I thanked Him, it didn't affect my life. And as we take communion, I mean, Paul says here, look, you have given that old life, you've, you've ridded yourself of it, rid yourself of it. You've put it to death. Don't go back to it. But in thanksgiving, in gratitude, put on the new life. And so as we take communion, yeah, there, there's some things that we pray about and consider, thank God for, but let us walk away in imitation of Christ. Not just thanking God, but imitating Jesus as we walk away from here. Um, <clears throat> so I want to um, pray for communion. And uh, I have a few questions that I'd like for you to consider as you take communion. What sin do you need to put to death? Who do you need to forgive? And I think a great place to start is who do you need to forgive in this room? Right here. Spend some time thanking God, and then consider how will you imitate Jesus this week. And if we could, can we leave this up during communion? Is that okay? Cool. So we'll leave this up, uh, but let's pray and take communion. God, we thank you for this time each week that we get to come together around the table, considering what Jesus did with his disciples as an example of, of what we are now doing 2,000 years later, coming around the table and remembering Jesus as the bread, the body that was sacrificed on the cross. Jesus, you handed your life over in humility. But that wasn't the final story. Lord, we're so grateful for your power that you raised Christ from the dead. And that in all of, our, in all of the, the things in our life that look like death and decay, God, you and you alone can and will produce life if we surrender to you, if we humbly come to you. God, I pray that the, the free gift that you have given us, which is eternal life, I pray that we would not deny you in it. Wherever we stand right now in our relationship with you, or maybe we're just trying to figure this out and we don't know who you are. God, wherever we're at, God, I pray that we would come humbly to you and figure it out. Just be grateful for you. And not just be grateful, but that our gratitude would result in us imitating Christ. God, thank you for renewing us day in and day out because each day comes with its challenges and it beats us up. But God, in you we are made new day in and day out, and we're so grateful. Um, God, may we walk away from here different. May we walk away from here considering how we can love one another and forgive one another and imitate Christ. We love you and pray these things in his name. Amen.
Morning. My name is Matt, and this is my beautiful, awesome wife, Jill. Um, today we get to have the uh, privilege to go ahead and share the offering with you. I'm going to share in Deuteronomy 15.10. And it says, Give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart. Then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and everything you put your hand to. You know, it's easy for us, you know, to get caught up with going to work, taking care of our families, paying bills, coming to church, and then writing the check for our offering. It almost comes to the point where it's, it's a checkoff list, you know, but we got to remember, God, it doesn't matter to God. It's about the heart, yeah. you know. We live in a first world country, but there is first world problems. I mean, I think of our homeless population in L.A. County alone. You know what I mean? But we get so caught up, am I going to have my Starbucks today? Or do I live close enough to the ocean? You know what I mean? And that's the, that's the struggle's real. You know, but that doesn't matter to God at the end of the day. You know, what matters is where is my heart before the Lord when I give to him? You know, he doesn't care about any of that. He just cares about our heart and is our motives pure towards what we give to him. My wife is going to go ahead and expand a little bit on that. Hey, guys. Um, so as Matt was talking, I definitely did a little heart check. So that's always good to do, right? Um, and I something that um, stood out to me is kind of like what sacrificial giving means. I mean, we all know many definitions of sacrifice and giving. So for all intents and purposes, the two I chose were these. Sacrifice means to surrender, the surrender of something for the sake of something else, right? And giving definitely is providing love or other emotional support, caring, kind of all of that. And then Matt like referenced writing a check, right? So we come in, sometimes we pay online, we write a check, we kind of do that, we dump it in the basket, we go along our day, right? Um, but the convicting part for me was the checklist. You know, I do the bills, so I'm like, oh, tithe, check, rent, check, this, check, and then I kind of move on, and then I read these definitions, and I'm like, oh, right, sacrificial giving is definitely surrendering of something for the sake of something else out of love, right? So am I, every time I give whatever it is, time, money, giving from a place of love. That's why God doesn't care about our amount. He cares about our heart. And so for me, remembering that and not just like, oh, yeah, it's the time where we give is like, do I truly give of something to God out of my love? Let's go ahead and pray for the offering. Dear God, thank you for this time to be able to give to you. Father, I really pray that you are with our hearts and our giving, God, and that our giving brings glory and honor to you, that we never forget how amazing and awesome God you are, Father, and how much you really appreciate us and how much you really desire for us, God, to just give with our heart and our heart to be right before you. God, thank you for your son and his sacrifice and this time to be together. In your son's name I pray, amen. Amen. After you've uh, been able to contribute, you can go ahead and stand for the final song. I was stumbling in the darkness, lost without a home. You took sins that were scarlet and made them white as snow. You turned my dog into light and you made me white as snow. Out of death into life and you made me white. to make me white as snow, singing you turn my dark into light, and you made 
Have a great day, guys.